Zoom line. Each of you on both of these medium platforms, and I also want to tell you that I really thank God for your participation and your presence as we continue in the Word of God um, for expectation. I'm grateful tonight um, that we are able to come to Psalm 133, uh, this psalm in which we have next, next, just about finished with these psalms of a degree or a sense. But these psalms are have been critical, I think, in helping us to to move to a spiritual place, which is what the psalmist intended, and move, move us out of the mundane place, which is where the world has us. And so as we read each of these psalms, each of these psalms or psalms kind of get us focused and fixated more and more on God and less and less on ourselves and less and less upon our circumstances. And I, as I've read these psalms, that's how I feel. I've remembered and been reminded that God is my protector, that God is my deliverer, uh, that even though sometimes we're in captivity, God will not only bring us out, but he'll bring us out and prosper us even as before if not and more. I recognize that working and trying to do things without God and without under the, under the, without the power of God uh, is, is pointless. I've also recognized the significance of a God-fearing family, uh, recognize that while we may have enemies, that all we have to do is wait on the Lord. We have to stand in humility as we wait, and we have to reckon and stand on the promises of God. Tonight we're going to talk about brotherly unity. And I'm going it's only three verses, but I'm going to try to take my time uh, as God wills, and so that we can see this not just as a song and not just as a psalm, but as a exhortation or as an encouragement of a way of life for all the children of God. If I could, I want us to get on a spiritual place and and, um, and go back with me together and picture the pilgrims in Israel coming back to the temple. They have traveled some from far and some from near. They have, have some have traveled together, some have traveled alone. They have come, some of them exhausted and tired physically, and some of them have uh, spent emotionally because of the trip and some because of the issues they had to face in their homeland as they came back to this temple celebration. But they did come to celebrate because they had a God to celebrate. They had a relationship with God to celebrate. And as they celebrated their relationship with God, they began, as the psalmist moves us, um, and the psalmist moves us, they began to worship God, to praise God, be reminded of who God is, and finally to embrace the reality of the power of God. I want to tell somebody today, the tragedy is not in having uh, growing weak in your spiritual place. The tragedy is staying weak because God has instructed us and has given us 66 books of the Bible, all of which are designed to strengthen us and encourage us in him. And so the psalmist wants us to understand that he wants the pilgrims to know that, and I believe that I know that God wants us to know this today as well, that, yes, we have some gaps between uh, our fellowship with him and communion with him, but during those gaps we have to be reminded of the word of God. In other words, as we go through the day, maybe we can't pray all day, but recognize that when you get to pray how important this prayer is for us and how important a communion is with between us and God for our spiritual lives. And so now they have celebrated. They have had a good time. And as they are about to wrap up uh, this particular session of the feast, um, the psalmist now moves them to a place where I think is critical for all of us to understand. The psalmist has moved them to a place of brotherly and sisterly unity. In other words, he explains to them now the importance of the unified body of believers. I want to be clear. I didn't say united. Because united and unified are two separate things. United is somebody who has the same thoughts, the same ideas, thinks the same thing, do the same thing. United is something that, that takes place uh, sometimes artificially. Unity is something that takes place organically as a result of the presence of the Spirit of God in our lives. Unity means we may disagree. We may be from different places. We have may have different friend groups. We may um, um, be different, different economically, socially, even racially. But we all recognize that we have something in common. Unity means there's something in common. And for the children of God, there's something in common is Jesus Christ and our Father God. And so as we look at this verse, let us keep this in mind and let us hear the words of the psalmist so that as we prepare ourselves to live this life that God has called us to live, both in our homes and when God brings us back together, let us understand that this was important enough, this theme, was important enough for us to, for the psalmist to include it as the people of Israel came back together. Let me tell a story parenthetically before we move into this text. The, the is, Israel's strength laid in, first of all, in the mighty power of God and their, their obedience to God. The second thing Israel had was their ability to work together under the power and the unity that God had given them. That's what made Israel great. What makes the body of Christ today great is the fact that we are all operating on the power of God unified by the Holy Spirit. 
And more than that, as we work together in that unity, we can do great things. The body of Christ and the national can do great things, and individual bodies of Christ, like St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church, and all other churches can do great things as we recognize the necessity, the importance, and the real impact of unity. On the hallway stairs going up um, to the second floor, some of you all may have read this, uh, Elder Flanagan, our beloved elder, uh, wrote, put this on the wall. It said, working together works. And every time I see that, I do two things. I think about him, but I think about what that means. That for us to work together means to lay aside our individual preferences and pick up the battle of Christ. And when we do that, it works for us, but most of all, it works for the Lord. So let us look at our three verses tonight uh, after I've given that soliloquy. Verse 1 says, Behold, the psalmist wants us to look up. He's trying to get the attention of the pilgrims. He's trying to get our attention. Behold, it's like, hey, y'all check this out, because I'm about to say something important. He says, how good and how pleasant. Let me stop there. How good. Good is, is, a, is a term that we have embraced, but good means that things are, that there's a balance, there's a peace, there's a joy inherent in good. Good is for others, but inherent in the word good is the, 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 the permanent peace and the permanent joy that comes, in this case, through a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It is good. It, it is good. It, it, it what makes it good? It makes it, it makes it good because there's peace and joy. There's no uproar. There's no up and down. There's no friction. There's no confusion. What does good mean? Good means that it is a place where God wants us to be. How good? How pleasant? Pleasant means it's refreshing, relaxing. As we are uh, in the presence of God, as we're in the presence of other friends, not only is it good, not only we are smiling about it, but we also are refreshed by the engagement. If anybody else has good friends or brothers or sisters or family, that you don't see all the time, but when you get in that pleasant, not only can you relax because it's good, but you are refreshed by maybe the stories you tell, maybe the things you have in common, maybe the the, the activities you participate in, maybe the things you're planning on doing, but it is both good and pleasant. And so the psalmist is saying to us, it is both good and it is pleasant for brethren. Now, this word is brethren, but it's not just for men. It's for men and women. It's for all those who are connected together as children of God. Israel was connected by their covenant with God. Um, through their, their actions. Our, we're connected to the actions of Christ. That's what brings us together, the actions of Jesus Christ, our faith in Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit brings us together. But we are brothers and sisters in what? In Christ. That's why we can say it to each other. Hello, brother in Christ. Hello, sister in Christ. Um, we, we, we claim that because it's real, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in all of us. The psalmist says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to do what? To dwell together in unity. I love this word dwell because dwell is not a transient word. Dwell does not mean you come and you go. Dwell means that you are in a place where you are comfortable you are, because it's good and pleasant, but you're also looking forward to being in that place for a period of time. If somebody comes to your house and they do a drop by, they just swing it by. But if somebody comes by your house to dwell, that means they're going to get comfortable. They may take off their, their shoes. They may let their hair down. Why? Because they want to be there. The psalmist is saying is we as children of God also want to be there. We also want to be where? In the presence of, of our brothers and sisters, and we also want to dwell together. And this word, in unity, means that we ought to want to dwell together in the unity that exists between us, that is that the Holy Spirit. Now, let me say this. If anybody ever been to a family reunion, you know how you get to a family reunion and you see folks you ain't seen long, and it's like you just saw them, you just so happy to see them. Why? Because it's a family reunion. Um, you all have the same blood, the same bloodlines, maybe the same mama, daddy, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, it's all all connected. And in doing so, what you find is there's a certain pleasantness and a certain goodness that you all get to dwell together. I used to, uh, when we were younger, I think Reverend Sands on the phone, we had family units all over the country on our um, our mother's side. And it would be always fun because I'd always remember on Friday night there'd be a fish fry. Now, that was good and bad. It was good because everybody hang out at fish fry. It was bad for me because I couldn't eat fish. So somebody always made me a cheese sandwich. I never understood why people thought a cheese sandwich was a substitute for some meat. That's why I couldn't get a burger or some chicken. But every year they made me some cheese sandwich while everybody else ate fish. But I love the fellowship. On Friday, on Saturday, we'd hang out together sometimes. The ladies would go shopping. The men would hang around. But ultimately, we were going to have a banquet that Saturday night. That Saturday night was the banquet, and people put on their clothes, and we just had some fun. And then on Sunday morning, we'd have a church fellowship, and then we'd leave. But those three days, we dwelt together. We enjoyed each other. The Bible is telling us here in verse 1 of chapter of Psalm 133 that it's important for us to dwell, to live, to, to desire to be in each other's presence in unity. It is very important to understand this point in unity. Here's the thing. Unity is something that exists, but it has to be worked at. It is in, 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 in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Let me read that. I didn't intend to read that, but the Lord just laid it on my heart. I want to read it again. In, in the book of Ephesians, um, Paul is very clear 
um, in chapter 4 that he says, I, I therefore, verse 1, the prisoner of the Lord beseech ye that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity. Look at this word, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He says unity there. And here in verse Psalm 133, verse 1, he says unity is said again. In other words, what Paul is saying here in Ephesians is, in order for there to be unity, it exists existentially, it exists existentially because of Christ and his sacrifice for us on the cross. But it has to be worked there because he uses this word in verse um, in chapter 4, verse 3. He says endeavoring. That means to work. If we have it, but we got to work to do what? To keep it. That unity and the spirit and the bond of peace. Now somebody says, well, how do we work to keep it? Well, go back up to verse 2 because in verse 2 says we have to be meek, humble, long-suffering, and forbear, forbear one another in love. So if we go back to Psalm 133, the psalmist says it is, it is, it is good and pleasant. How good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. To dwell there that means that we got to be meek. we got to be humble. we got to be for long-suffering. we got to put up with each other in love. That's what it takes to dwell together in unity. But he lets us know that the outcome is what? Good and pleasant. Sometimes, and I'm in the pastor right now, so I'm going to let you all know about to come in the pastor, but to come in here high. The reality is so many times in the body of Christ, in the church, we allow the most picky picayune and petty and small and insignificant things to separate us. I want us to understand, first and foremost, that is the state effort to keep us from experiencing the full power of God in our lives and the full power of God in what God wants us to do. And so what we must understand is there's a blessing for us. What is the blessing? There's, a, there's good and pleasantness in dwelling together in unity. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were talking about, you know, I was doing some counseling, somebody says, well, you know, my my kids moved out. They just, we just couldn't get along no more. And so I said, well, how do you feel about that? She said, it hurts me and it hurts them. And I thought to myself, okay, so if everybody's hurt, it seems like to me that needs, 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 there needs to be a work together. So I couldn't help but to say, hey, if that's the case, let's see if we work together to bring everything back together because it's not necessary to be broken apart because there's a bond that you all have as a family, and that bond is something to you should work on and work for. That means somebody got to be quiet and somebody got to stand up and say something that maybe needs to be said. Whatever the case is, it needs to be worked at. The same thing is true in the body of Christ today. We have to work at it. That means that sometimes you've got to swallow what you want to say. That's, that's, that's meekness. Sometimes you got to deal with somebody that you don't feel like being bothered with, um, but they're all together in unity in Christ. That, that's forbearing. That, that's long-suffering. And sometimes you just got to say, you know what, that's my brother, Sister Christ, and I love him anyway. That's for being one in love. In love. And finally, you got to something the Bible says, well, think not so highly by ourselves. That's humility. Those are the things that take take place for us to work together. Let me say this to Pastor St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church, is that as we come back together, it is going to be important for us to hit on all cylinders. Deacon Lines and I were talking the other day, and we're expecting when God brings us back together, we're going to hit on full cylinders. What that means, we're going to be serving the Lord and, and witnessing for the Lord, evangelizing for the Lord, and showing the world who the Lord is um, like we've never done before. But evangelizing is important. Witnessing is important. But showing our love is not just about how what do we give out a track, that we give out some food. Showing the love is about how we connect one another. Because the Bible lets us know in first in John and in first John that the world knows us by our love for each other. And so let us know as we get ready together. And I want somebody to do this. Um, if you have uh, all with your brother and sister, now is the time. Can I pass them? Now is the time for us to call somebody and say, listen, you know what? We weren't speaking for this pandemic, but I, I'm sorry. You say I'm sorry. Don't ask him to forgive. You say I'm sorry. I wouldn't say this, and it's really interesting that the Lord did this today. That was a long-time friend of mine that we hadn't spoken in several months. And, and today, of all days, um, he came over, and we sat, and we talked. And before we got into the conversation, I said, let me tell you, I'm sorry. He said, for what? I said, well, I obviously heard your feelings. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for how I didn't return your call. I'm sorry for these. And, I, and when we finished the conversation, I said, and I added whatever else he said. Somebody might say, well, that was weak. No, it wasn't weak. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be able to move, get out of ourselves. He wants us to be able to work together. This is my brother in Christ, and I hadn't seen him and talked to him in months. It was essential. And it, it was interesting when I, when I had this meeting with him, it wasn't planned. It wasn't even planned. But when I, when I recognized for Psalm 130 was our next time up. I said, well, Lord, you, you let me know something. You showed me something. I want us to do that as individuals in this body of Christ. Call somebody tell them I'm sorry. Call somebody tell them I love you. Call somebody say, it's weak. I can't wait to get back connected with you. And in the meantime, I'm going to text you and call you, email you, and I'm send you a letter. I'm letting you know how much I love you. That's important for us. It is, it is, it is good and pleasant. At the end of our fellowship today, it was a good and pleasant moment. Why? Because we had a chance to move things aside and to dwell together in, in unity. 
uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the spirit that God has given us. This is what the psalmist says next. This unity and this fellowship is like, look at verse 2, it is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment. Here's the key operation of understanding this whole concept of unity. Two things. Let me get, let me paint the picture, and then let's look at it practically. Verse 2, um, the Aaron as, as in the priestly office would have his head anointed. Now, anointing of, with oil had two purposes. First of all, it was practical. Anointing with oil was practical because um, the, as the, the arid region of, of Palestine, there were a lot of flies and insects that flew around. And so if a person got sweaty and dusty, that would attract what? That would attract these insects. Anybody been in Atlanta in the summertime or anywhere in Georgia, Alabama, or anywhere in the south, in the summertime, know when you sweat, what's going to happen? Bugs are going to come around. The oil would wash away or wipe away or cover the the sweat or the, the grime or the grit that drew the insects in. So it was a practical thing that it would do that. Now, hold on to that one. The second thing that oil represented, however, um, was the Holy Spirit. So practically, it, it, it covered up the scent that drew bugs in. Uh, secondly, it did represent the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit moves and flows like that. But here's the key. The reason why they didn't know Aaron's feet or his arms or his legs or his chest was because the Holy the, the, the anointing was supposed to come down. In other words, they said he put it on his head, but they would put so much it would drip down all over his body, all the way there to his skirts and his garments, so this, really to his feet. This is what we must understand spiritually. Now, I'm going back, to back, back up to this one. The Lord just gave us, and, and, and we must understand that the Holy Spirit comes from the head, not, not our head. It comes from the head of Christ. In other words, as we understand that Christ is the head of the church, that Christ is our head, as we focus on the head, what we will experience is the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit filling us, and in this case, flowing over us. In which case, we can find ourselves better equipped to be in unity with one another. But let me give you a practical one. As we focus on the head, what we find out is not only will the Holy Spirit cover us, but it will cover up our in, it will cover up our weaknesses. It will cover up our inadequacies and our idiosyncrasies and our trip, our trip, our parts. And as everybody does that, it will be covered up, and we will be better equipped and able to get along one with another. In other words, if you put two smelly people in the room, they might can't stand each other, but put two people who are fragrant in the room, guess what? They is a blessing and a pleasant place to be. As we are filled with the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit fills us, what we'll find is we are in a place where the presence of God causes us to desire to be in each other's presence because of the presence of the Holy Spirit and the anointing that comes from the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let me say this. Many of us, and I've done this myself, so I can, I can talk turkey. We have focused more on what somebody else is doing or focus on how we were victims. This verse lets us know that we're to focus on God. If we focus on God, what somebody else did or how we feel becomes secondary because the Spirit of God, as we focus on the Lord, will move us to a place where we are able to get past ourselves. Can I say it one more time? The Spirit of God will move us to a place where we can get past ourselves. It is essential for the children of God in order to get along. And some people say, I can't work with this person. I can't work with that person. Can I tell you something? Can I pass a sense at it? That is not biblical. It is biblical for folks to come from different places and different backgrounds with different issues and situations. And we work together because the Spirit of God knits us together in love. That's essential for us to understand. And that's what the psalmist is telling the pilgrims, and that's what the Lord is telling us today. We have to do that. We have to work together, and we have to understand that we have to focus on God. Don't focus on who you don't like. Don't focus on what you don't like. Don't focus on they did me wrong. Focus on God and God. And the Holy Spirit will elevate you above that so that we can work together. Let me do this last verse. I'm going to let y'all go. It's Friday night. Verse 3 says, As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. Let me stop there. The dew of Hermon, the dew that descended upon heaven. Anybody ever, anybody ever seen dew fall? No, we never seen it. We've seen the results of it in the morning, in the summertime. We see the grass wet, and we say, Well, it wasn't no, it wasn't no rain last night, but it was the dew. It, 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 the dew comes from. The, the, the cooling of this of the cooling of the earth with the moisture that's inherited in the air caused there to be due. Nobody sees due. It just comes to pass. That's what God wants us to have happen in us. That's what God wants to happen. As we focus on him, we won't be able to see a lot of stuff, but we will experience the outcome. We won't be able to we might not have no meetings where people come to Jesus, but what we will find is we find ourselves in Jesus' name working together. And that's what God is trying to accomplish in us. And that's what it takes. I had a conversation with a member yesterday, and I was so pleased I almost brought me to tears because there was a conversation that was had 
that nobody had to call a meeting. There was nobody had to mediate it. There was something that moved in this member spirit, and that member went to that spirit, member spirit, and they had a conversation, and everything worked out. That was, that's like the do of Herman. There was no explanation for it. It just was. Last thing, for that, where? The, in the, in, upon the mountain of Zion, in the do of Herman, the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. In this posture of working together in unity, in this posture of working together and being in unity and being letting God be the head and then the Holy Spirit fill us and, 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 and anoint us and refresh us and revive us and renew us. As we do this, what we recognize is, and I love this part right here, he, the Lord commanded the blessing. What's the blessing? That we enjoy our fellowship. And then he says, even life forevermore. For the longest time, I didn't really put my finger on that. But the Lord revealed that to me. Even life forevermore. Can I tell somebody? How many folks want to go to heaven out there? Zoom, y'all got to raise your hands. If you want to go to heaven, I want you to understand this. We're going to be together for eternity. We might have been members of St. Peter. I've been a member of St. Peter now. Let me see. 53, 43, 48 years. How about that? 48 years of member of St. Peter. And, but I want you to understand this. As long as that may seem, eternity is, is exponentially longer than that. And so the Bible wants us to know, and God wants us to know here, that as we come together, we'll be blessed with the unity that God's given us, but also we'll have life forevermore with the Lord and with each other in God's presence. And so recognize that we go to heaven, we're going to be walking around the same folks we walk around now because we stay together. And as we get to heaven, let us know that we're going to have to turn together, so we may as well start working together in unity now so that we can enjoy unity when we get in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to stop tonight because uh, I know it's Friday. Some folks got some stuff on the grill. Maybe I got some on the grill, I think. Uh, but I'm going to do a little. Everybody have a good fellowship tonight with each other and with your families. But when we start thinking about this now, practically, let us start laying aside any issues we have and let us start working together uh, so that we can experience this pleasant and good fellowship that God has ordained for us so that we can be blessed by God so that we can look forward to being with each other in eternity. I love each other and we may God bless you. Let us pray together tonight. In Jesus' name, Lord, we come to say thank you for three verses. Three verses in which, Lord, you reminded us of the necessity and the importance of unity. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us it's not something to be taken for granted, but something to be rejoiced in, because in unity we have the good and pleasant fellowship that you have ordained for your people. Help us to know, Lord, uh, that it's important for us, Lord, to focus on you and let the Spirit move in us to where we need to be so that we can accomplish all those things you have, have called us to accomplish in unity. I pray, God, that this word, this message, these three verses will lay and get in our ears so we can hear it. Let it get in our heart so we can feel it. Let it get in our feet so we can walk it. And let it get in our mind so we can think it. And let it get in our mouth so we can speak it to a dying world, to each other, and to ourselves. God, I pray that every household is blessed tonight. Every believer that is on this line is blessed up exponentially well tonight. And I pray, God, that even as we through that, that you'd allow us by the power of your wonderful Holy Spirit to have our families and our the household's blessed because of this word tonight as we share it with them and in all other capacities. And, Lord, we love you and thank you. It is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good night, phone line. Amen. Amen.